You know, I was sitting there thinking as, as we were getting started, it reminded me, I'm having this flashback of when I was a kid sitting in an old country church with the windows raised up, the fans in the windows to try to cool off the congregation. Uh, it just kind of took me back to a moment in time of uh, what I'm going to say was a simpler time. You know, we find ourselves in a very interesting time these days. You know, I think each of us would agree that prayer is an important aspect of our life. You know, athletes spend an incredible amount of time training and conditioning their bodies. They spend hours and hours and hours and days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks in the gym, in the pool, um, doing their specific exercises so that when it comes time for them to perform, their muscle memory kicks in and it just takes over and to overcomes the nerves and overcomes all the, the uh, excitement of what is taking place. You know, and as I got to thinking about muscle memory, I got to thinking in our spiritual walk and in our spiritual life, are we conditioned to pray just like muscle memory is for athletes. You know, when it comes time for us to, to have to respond and when we're going through a difficult time, are we conditioned to pray exactly like that? As you're finding your way to Acts chapter 12, which is where we're going to be this morning, I kind of want to set the stage for you for where we're at in the book of Acts. Earlier in the book of Acts, Jesus has uh, already been crucified. He has risen from the grave and He has ascended into heaven. When we come to Acts chapter 7, if you remember, Stephen was stoned to death. He was martyred for his faith. When we come to Acts chapter 9, uh, remember Saul's Damascus Road conversion when, when God showed up and Saul became Paul and became an incredible uh, disciple and apostle for Christ. And then when we come to kind of Acts chapter 10... Uh, an interesting thing begins to happen as the gospel begins going to the Gentiles. Now, that was a very significant moment as the gospel starts going to the Gentiles because it did not make the Jews very happy. They were not excited that the Gentiles were able to come into this relationship with Christ. All throughout the early part of the book of Acts, Peter is a very prominent figure within the book of Acts. Um, Peter is one of the, those that were part of Jesus' inner circle. Uh, Peter was one of those that, that saw Jesus firsthand. And when Jesus ascended back into heaven, Peter became a prominent role and a prominent figure in the spreading of the gospel and in the birth of the early church. So when we, when we get to Acts chapter 12, that is kind of the, the scene that we find ourselves in. And I would like for us to read the, start out reading the first five verses. Now about that time, Herod, that's, that is uh, Herod Agrippa, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church. Now this was not a, one of those uh, laying on of hands where he's trying to bless them or anything like that. It's actually uh, Herod is persecuting them. So Herod is laying hands on some who belong to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to put him to bring him before the people, basically having a trial. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Now just a brief little bit of history to understand who Herod is. If you remember, when Jesus was born, there was King Herod the Great. And then after King Herod the Great came Herod Antipas. If you remember, Herod Antipas was the one that had John beheaded, John the Baptist. And then after Herod Antipas came Herod Agrippa who was the grandson of Herod the Great. So, not really a, uh, an inviting lineage uh, for, for the, the Christians to be a part of. But King Herod Agrippa was a Jew. 
So he wanted to gain favor with the Jewish people. He wanted to kind of uh, boost himself up as part of that process. So when we get to our passage today, we learned that King Herod was laying hands on the Christians. He was persecuting them. The, the King James has a nice word, a really kind of cool word in verse 1, because it said that he vexed them. So the idea is that, that he was totally doing things to them that would harm them, that would mistreat them. And we also saw that he actually killed James. Now, most of your translations may say that he killed James with a sword. The thought that he is, was that James was beheaded. So things are not going incredibly great right now for the Christians. Uh, they, have been, they have been persecuted, they've been beaten, they've kind of been scattered um, into their remote areas right now because of all the persecution that was taking place. But the message of Jesus Christ was continuing forward. The message was, was moving forward. Christ was being proclaimed, lives were being transformed, and people were coming into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When Herod saw that the beheading of James pleased the people, he began to kind of take note of that. And I just want to make a side note that when we start making decisions based off of pleasing people, it is a very dangerous path to go down. Because it will lead us into places where we will compromise our own integrity, we will compromise our own beliefs in order to please people. Because all of you know that people's preferences, opinions, and desires change. So if, we are, if our goal is to please people, we are setting ourselves up for failure. So as the energy is building with the killing of James, the king has an idea. He said, wait a minute. He said, if the people were this pleased because of what I did for James, or what I did to James, imagine what they will feel if I arrest Peter and do the same thing to him. So he begins to kind of develop this scheme in his mind of what he's going to do. So as he begins to do that, he says, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to arrest Peter while all these people are in Jerusalem. Now it says that this was the time of unleavened bread. That may not mean a whole lot to us, but the Passover festival took place during this time. Passover was a big celebration for the Jews. It was a time where they all came to the city to offer their sacrifices. So the king says, you know what? Since I've got all of these people here, I've got an audience, I will bring Peter to trial. Now the idea is that this is not going to be a real trial. This is going to be a kangaroo court. Because he already knows what he's going to do. If he had killed James and it brought them pleasure, I'm going to do the same thing to Peter. So he begins to kind of develop this scheme and this idea of I'm going to bring Peter to trial and I'm going to kill Peter just like I did James. But in order for Peter not to escape during the Passover, he says, I'm going to put four squads of soldiers. Now the King James uses a nice word of quaternion. And the idea is that this is four groups of four soldiers each. Two soldiers are chained to Peter and then there's two soldiers guarding the gate. It's kind of Herod's idea of a maximum security prison. And then every three hours, this team of soldiers would rotate so that there was always somebody on alert and then there was always somebody chained to Peter. So there was no possible way, humanly speaking, that Peter could escape. So, so the king develops this strategy. Now, all of that is kind of provides us some nice backstory for the scene for what is taking place. And I want to draw your attention specifically to verse 5 because verse 5 creates an incredible transition for us. It says that while Herod had put Peter in prison and had kept him there, there's a big word, but. And in the middle of verse 5, there is a big but because there's a huge transition that is taking place. It says that while Peter was in prison, and while Peter had been in prison, the church began to pray. And the church prayed fervently. So don't miss that. So that leads, leads me to my first point. The reflex of unified prayer. The reflex of unified prayer. When Peter was sent to prison on the heels of James, James's beheading, the church began to pray. How did they know how to do that? Or how did they know this was a time? 
The church was young. It wasn't like the church had been there a hundred years like us. The church was very, very young. They had no concept of what a church really was even supposed to be or supposed to do. All they knew was that they were a body of believers that had believed in the risen Savior of Jesus Christ. So how did they know that they were supposed to pray? I think it was a direct reflection of what Peter had taught them. I think that Peter had demonstrated to them the value of prayer. I think Peter had demonstrated to them the importance of prayer. After all, Peter was a part of Jesus' inner circle. Peter had seen Jesus pray. Peter was with Jesus, Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane when, Peter, when Jesus was praying. That was before Peter fell asleep. But he was there. He saw it. He knew what was going on. And early on, Peter had taught the church to pray. In Acts chapter 4, when uh, Peter and John were before the church council, it, Scripture tells us that the church was praying. They were praying for boldness to proclaim the gospel, and God honored that prayer. But it's not just about a group of people praying. And while that is important, what I want you to see at the end of verse 5 is that they were praying fervently. They were praying earnestly. They were praying without ceasing. We've heard that in Scripture before. But the idea is, and the word that is used here has the, has the concept of a muscle that is stretched to the point of breaking. When they were praying fervently, they were praying with everything that they had, with everything that they knew of, of Christ to be. They were laying it all out on the line in prayer for Peter to God. I wonder if they were praying for Peter's protection. I wonder if they were praying for Peter's safety or for Peter's release from prison or for Peter's peace. And I actually think all of those were a component of what they were praying for. After all, they know what's coming ahead for Peter. And they also know that the church is under heavy persecution right now from King Herod. So given the level of persecution that was already taking place, I imagine that prayer was a very strong component of what they were doing. Now, it does not tell us how they started praying. It doesn't say that there was somebody that was a prayer coordinator who said, hey guys, we got a lot going on. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get together. Let's come together and let's pray for Peter. It doesn't tell us that. All it tells us is that when they heard Peter w was in prison, they started praying. And what I think happened is I think that they were living in a state of prayer. I think prayer was a natural reflex for what they were doing. They heard Peter was in prison. They immediately kicked in and started praying. I think it was an organic change that took place that they immediately started praying for Peter when they heard what had happened. But let's continue reading in verse 6. And on that very night, when Herod was about to bring him, that's Peter, forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and roused him up, saying, Get up quickly! And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said, Excuse me. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow and did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from them. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where many were gathered together and were, were praying. God is working even when we do not see it. And that's my second point. God is working even when we do not see it. As the church was continuing to pray for Peter, God was working in Peter's life. As the church was praying, God was working. Even though 
Peter and the church were physically separated, they were united together spiritually through Christ. Time was running out for Peter. Did you hear it? It was the night that Peter was going to be brought to trial. It was going to be the end for Peter. Herod knew that he was going to have Peter killed. But yet, in the midst of this tense time, in the midst of this strong persecution, in the midst of this upcoming trial, where do we find Peter? Sound asleep. Did you hear that? Sound asleep. What an answer to prayer. Peter is peacefully resting, knowing what lies ahead of him. Now, I do not think he was in a king-size bed with one of those comfy pillows that just kind of snuggles nice around the contour of his neck, wrapped up in a papoose, just, just, just enjoying and having the time of his life. I don't think that was the bed he was laying in. I imagine it was a cold, wet, hard, stone floor, both hands chained to guards. But yet we find Peter sound asleep, so much so that when the angel shows up, shines the bright light in the room, Peter is still sound asleep. The angel has to go over and whack Peter to get him to, to wake up. He says, get your clothes on, get your shoes on, we're getting out of here. So Peter, kind of not really understanding fully what is going on, half asleep, he gets his clothes on, he gets his shoes on, he gets ready, and they head out the door. Did you notice what the angel said to him? Get your clothes on and follow me. Now this is not the first time Peter has heard that phrase. The last time he heard that phrase was when Christ called him to be an apostle. And that decision that Peter made changed his life forever. This time, when the angel says, follow me, it's a very similar type of situation that Peter's life is going to be changed as well. So Peter gets up, gets ready, and out the door they go, past the guards. The chains fell off. They walk past the guards. They go to the gate, past the guards, and the gate flings open for them. And then there they are standing in the middle of the street. Peter in a half-asleep stupor saying, okay, this is kind of interesting. This is kind of neat. This is not what I expected to happen. But then when they get out to the street, the angel is gone. Peter finally comes to his senses, looks around, and recognizes that he's out in the street all by himself. Now, he also recognizes that God has delivered him. He recognizes that while he may be physically standing there alone, he is actually not alone because God has delivered him and God is with him. But don't lose sight of verse 12 because verse 12 tells us the church is continuing to pray. The church is unaware of how God is answering that prayer, but God is moving, God is responding, God is acting. The church prays, God is acting. So Peter, now that he has come to his senses, goes where one place he know of the church is going to be, and that is at Mary's house, the home of John Mark. So he goes up to the house, and he does what any of us would do. He knocks on the door. Because he won't sin. He doesn't know how long he has before the guards wake up, before the guards come and approach him, before the guards attack him. He goes and he knocks on the door. So let's keep reading in verse 13. And when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced Peter was standing in front of the gate. And they said to her, You are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was, that it was so. And they kept saying, Nope, it is an angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them, The Lord had led me out of prison. And so he said, Report these things to James. This is the other James. This is James, Jesus' brother. And the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. So that brings me to my last point. The power of united prayer. The power of united prayer. According to verse 12, the house church that was at Mary House had been praying all night long and possibly a couple of nights for Peter. They had been in this intense, fervent 
prayer for Peter. And as they're praying, there's a knock at the gate. And the servant girl of the house goes out to the gate, and I imagine that she says, Who's there? It's the middle of the night. She doesn't want to draw attention, so she says, Who's there? And I imagine Peter says, It's Peter. Or he may have said, It's me. Because Scripture says that she recognized his voice. And then she goes into the prayer meeting and said, Peter's here! Peter's here! Our prayers have been answered. Peter's here. And the ever-loving church said, You are out of your mind. It's not Peter. It's probably his angel. No, 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 no. It is Peter. I heard him and I saw him. No, nope, no, nope, you're out of your mind. So they went. As Peter's continuing to knock, Hello guys, it's me. Let me in. Peter continues to knock. And they all eventually go to the door and recognize that it's Peter. But notice who recognized it was Peter. It wasn't one of the church leaders. It wasn't the pastor. It wasn't the chairman of deacons. It was a servant girl who recognized the answer to God's prayer. And I think that is a reminder for us that God speaks to each one of us. You know, by the grace of God on the cross, through Christ, we do not have to go to a priest. God speaks directly to us through His Holy Spirit. And I think that is an important lesson for us to be mindful of. While they were praying, the answer was literally standing right in front of them. Part of our prayers when we pray should not only be for what specifically we're praying for, but that God would open our eyes to see how He's working. Our prayer should be that God would make us aware of what He's doing around us and recognizing that. You know, when this passage is read and taught, the focus is usually on Peter. And rightfully so. I mean, it's a pretty amazing story of what happened to Peter. But I think a strong component of this is what the church is doing. The church is continuing to pray. You know, in verse 17, it told us that the church was, was praying. And in verse 5, we saw that the church was praying. In verse 5 and 12, we saw that the church was praying. While Peter was freed, in a miraculous fashion, he directed that attention to God and what God had done and what God was doing. He was aware of the work that God had done. If, if, in, if in the answer to our prayers we do not point people to Christ, we have missed the lesson in the praying. To know God more is to make God more known. Now this all seems like a pretty cool story, and it would make for a pretty entertaining movie, quite honestly. But you may be actually sitting there asking, so what? What does this have to do with me today? I've prayed and God doesn't seem to answer. Or I've prayed and the answer that God has given me is not the answer that I thought He should give. Or I've prayed and nothing seems to happen. It just seems like my prayers are not going anywhere or that my prayers just are not getting through. If our prayers are just to get something from God, then that is no different than the prosperity gospel methodology where if I do this, God will do that. You see, our prayers are more about seeking the face of God and drawing closer to Him for the proclaiming of His name and reflecting His glory than it is about getting what we want. So the question that I have to ask is, who is this Christ and why does He matter? You see, each of us are born into this world a sinner. Each of us has missed the mark of perfection that God has set for us. You see, Christ gave up His throne in heaven to come to live on earth to be born as a baby, to experience the same things that you and I experience, to walk the walk that you and I experience, and to interact with people just like we do. Except He did not sin. He was the spotless Lamb of God. His purpose for coming was to go to the cross and pay the penalty of your sin and my sin. You see, the penalty of sin is death. That is what we deserve. We deserve 
to die. He's separated from God because of that sin. But you see, Christ came and paid that penalty on the cross for us. Now, just because He paid that penalty, that, that's great. But you see, there comes a point in our life where we have to admit that we are a sinner, separated from God by our sin. You see, Christ is the atoning sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice for that sin. And by us admitting that we are a sinner separated from God by that sin, turning away from our sin, that's called repentance, placing our faith and trust in who Jesus is and the finished work of Christ on the cross, we can have a personal relationship with Him. You see, when Christ died on the cross, He paid the once and for all penalty. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave three days later, demonstrating his power over death. He is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, praying and interceding on our behalf. You see, through that relationship with him, we have eternal life. Through that relationship with him, he gives us hope. Through that relationship with him, he is always with us. Through that relationship with him, he gives us peace. Through that relationship with him, he is always faithful. He is always uh, consistent. He is always providing. I don't know about you, but we find ourselves in some really dark times these days. Not only with the pandemic that is going on, the uncertainty that exists around the world, certainly the challenges that exist in the Middle East, we find ourselves in very, very difficult times. I honestly don't know how people make it outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. I honestly don't. Because it is through the relationship with Him that He gives us peace in the midst of these trying and difficult times. But maybe you're a believer that has accepted Christ, but maybe you're not living the life that you should. I encourage you to ask God for forgiveness. Turn away from those things that are leading you away from Christ and turn back to Christ in repentance. In November of 1854, Evangelist George Mueller, who was known as a devout man of prayer, began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. He prayed every day, whether sick or in health. No matter what other things competed for his time, he prayed. Eighteen months passed, and the first one became a Christian. He gave thanks to God and continued praying for the other four. Five years later, the second one became a Christian. He thanked God and continued to pray for the other three. Six more years had passed and the third one came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. He thanked God and continued to pray for the other two. Thirty-six years later, the other two still had not become a Christian. But he continued to pray for them fervently, day after day. He continued to pray. And he said, God, my hope is in you. I would just wait and watch you work as I continue to pray. The other two became a Christian, but not until after he died. But he continued to pray fervently day after day. As a church, how well conditioned are we to pray? Our prayers may not be answered when we expect or the way we expect, but God is still sovereign and He answers in accordance with with His will. We have to look no further than our own church to see that play out. The past three and a half years have been unlike years we've ever experienced. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed that God would send us a pastor. In the midst of that praying for a pastor, God also introduced to us a pastor halfway around the world in Tanzania, Pastor Emmanuel. During that time, Pastor Emmanuel was praying and praying and praying and praying for Bibles. When God crossed our paths, Pastor Emmanuel began to pray for us as we began to pray for him as well. And then, in God's timing, God brought to us and led to us Pastor Trent, Jennifer, Larson, and TJ. And God has blessed us through them and their ministry as they are leading us into the ministry God has called us to. And God has blessed Pastor Emmanuel in the ministry that he is doing in Tanzania as the thousands of people have come to a relationship with Christ through his ministry and the Bibles that we have sent. 
God is faithful. And God is a sustainer. Are we conditioned to pray? So let me ask this question as we close. Which do you desire more? To see God answer the prayer or to see, or to see God glorified through the answering of the prayer? Now that sounds like a distinction without a difference, but it's not. You see, if we desire more to see God answer the prayer, the focus is on us, on what we have been praying for. But if we desire to see God glorified through the answering of the prayer, then the focus is on God. To know God more is to make Him more known. May we be conditioned to pray so that our desire is to see Him glorified more and to make much of His name. Let's pray. Most gracious God, I just thank You for who You are. Dear God, I thank You for sending Jesus to die on the cross as a payment for our sin. Dear God, I pray that the time we have spent here today brings glory and honor to Your name. I pray that if there is someone here today that does not have a personal relationship with you, I pray that today is the day that they enter in that relationship. If there is someone here today that has strayed away from you, I pray that today is the day that they return to that fellowship and that relationship with you. Dear God, you're an awesome God and you're a sovereign God. Forgive us for when we fail you. Forgive us for when we make it about you. Forgive us for when we don't make it about you and make it about ourselves. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this, this place where we can come to worship you. May we continue to praise your name in all that we do. Of course, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.